The director of One Piece Film Red, Goro Taniguchi, knows what the One Piece is, and according to him, he's known for about 24 years. And also, One Piece Film Red is the film that Ichiro Oda has most actively participated in the development of. So drink some straight up black coffee and keep your eyes open because this movie goes deep, really deep when it comes to understanding, I think, the biggest lore, secrets, and even fundamental concepts that Oda himself hasn't fully fleshed out in the canon manga. And this movie, One Piece Film Red, in a deep, deep dive, I'm going to argue in subtle meaningful ways tackle subjects like the voice of all things, Zoro's Ashra, and even the sun god Nika itself. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, leave, skedaddle. This video is not for you because I don't want to spoil you. Just watch the movie, support if you can, because this movie, I think without a doubt, is worthy of being the number one One Piece film of all time, at least so far, and one of the best-selling movies in Japanese history, without a doubt. So, for these secrets, I'm gonna tackle not only just the movie itself, but also two particular outside materials that orbit the movie. And there will be timestamps in the description box down below. So let's say you wanna skip ahead because I'm talking about this information you're already aware of, Cool, so then jump to the parts that you don't know, particularly the deep dive section where things are really gonna get crazy. But first and foremost, let's tackle the two orbiting materials of the One Piece Film Red movie that do give us more insight on various important things. First and foremost, the One Piece Volume 4 Billion. It was a free volume that was given to the first 3 million attendees of the movie. And I'm gonna go over the key points of volume 4 billion as we know them so far. So first and foremost, around the time of Shanks' visit to Fusha Village, when he still had both arms and a revealed bounty of 1.04 billion, he was also known as the murderer of the color of observation hockey. <gasps> what? Shanks is able to somehow prevent people from seeing the future. And I'm going to assume this means about himself. So he's able to somehow prevent people from seeing his own future. This is a shocking reveal and a nasty, a nasty countermeasure to that ability. And I kind of view it, let's say, as a Hunter Hunter Zetsu, where let's say he can actually somehow completely snuff out his own presence to the point where no one can see Shanks' future, ideally. And it actually might tie to what the Minks do in chapter 805, where the Minks are all around Luffy, but even though he is at that point in time still skilled with the observation hockey, he can't sense the Minks around him. So there are ways to actually counter someone's observation hockey, and Shanks is very proficient in those ways. The next thing here is that Shanks can actually fight using a flaming sword. Shanks is what Jon Snow failed to be, Azor High, which we do see in the movie. Shanks' sword is legitimately on fire. This will definitely need its own deeper dive, and I do have a video plan for that, but my ideas for this are just running. The baseline, however, is pretty simple. The baseline would be, Elemental hockey exists. This is actually something I do refer to back in a video I made pretty much a decade ago when I was kind of first starting off the whole YouTube thing. Now it could be coming back a decade later if it's genuinely hockey that is the root cause of Shanks having a flaming sword. After this, Shanks was found in a treasure chest 38 years ago when he was one years old. The same way he found Uta in a treasure chest 19 years ago when she was two years old. And of course, Shanks was found by Roger, and this actually lines up on the time of God Valley, which of course is an event that right now we know very little about. However, for this video, there's going to be something important later on that is also going to reference God Valley. Now, after all of this for Shanks, we have Shanks' crew. Number one is Ben Beckman. Ben Beckman is very skilled with hockey and also marksmanship. He is also a ladies' man. Good for him. 
Number two is Yasop. Yasop is also a perfectionist and also apparently a dancer. After that is Lucky Roo, where Lucky Roo is a chef, of course, given his size, it is what it is. And he has, unfortunately for him, no luck with women, but has great hockey skills. And like we see in the film, can also turn into a ball. After that is Lime Juice. Lime Juice can skywalk like Sanji. After that, we have Bone Punch. Apparently, Bone Punch has these powerful charge up punches, kind of like, let's say, Donkey Kong and Smash, and also has a little Epo in him, baby, where he does have these nasty counter punches too. And then on top of that, the monkey that's always on his shoulder, Monster, will fight against enemies while Bone Punch is charging up his punches. So a very damn good tag team right there, degeneration style. After those two is Hongo. Hongo the doctor is great at apparently dismantling weapons. So kind of like the Frankie family when it comes to ships. And as far as you know, Hongo can dismantle almost any weapon instantly or not instantly. After Hongo is Howling Gab. Apparently Howling Gab is not only just afraid of ghosts and bugs, but also can yell air blades from his mouth and utilize paralysis techniques to some extent. So in my mind, he is the red hair pirate version of the first One Piece movie villain, El Drago. If you know, you know. And then finally we have Bill Snake. Bill Snake practices the juggling two sword style and fights using acrobatic moves and kicks. So Build Stick right now appears to be a more hardcore version of Kabaji on Buggy's crew. But instead of a one week circus rookie, he is a decade long circus performing expert. He is a wizard when it comes to his two sword juggling style. So that is it when it comes to Shanks and his crew. The key information I gathered from the One Piece volume 4 billion. Finding out more about Shanks and his crew, very good stuff. Now we get into the Chronicles of Uta. So not many folks are aware of this, but the Chronicles of Uta are actually special content that exist on the official website for the movie. And it does have some very interesting details about the movie and also about the series as a whole. So first things first, a few years after Shanks found Uta, she would sing and the members of his crew would fall asleep. So her ability of the Sing Sing ability was either something that Uta got a few years after Shanks found her, or she had already consumed that ability when she was a two-year-old child when Shanks found her in that treasure chest. It was confirmed that she was kidnapped by pirates in the Chronicles of Uta and then put in that chest. So why they did that exactly, we don't know, but it may pertain to her having an ability in the first place. That's the first thing. Second thing here, while Uta was on the Red Force ship waiting for everyone to finish their battles, she would fantasize about a world of dreams to take her mind off of things. So this would be a constant thing for her from the ages of two to nine, and that's where she actually built her ideas up of the world of dreams in her head. A peaceful world where there's no conflict, plenty of food and clothing, comfortable homes, and of course, beautiful music. Then it's revealed that Uta is likely the first person or one of the first people to know Luffy's hidden dream. The very thing that he told Ace and Sabo during the ASL flashback, the same thing that he told the Strat crew in 1060 and what Roger told Whitebeard and Oden during the Oden flashback. Apparently Uta actually knew this herself and right now she is the very first person that knew it because in the Chronicles of Uta, Luffy tells her this when the scar is not under his left eye. So that actually even predates Sabo and Ace. Uta knew this dream before Sabo and Ace did. And in the movie, there is an established connection between Luffy's dream in some ways and Uta's dream in some ways. Because Luffy in the movie doesn't hate her dream immediately. In fact, he's supportive of it. And at the very end of the Chronicles of Uta, they actually remind the audience that Luffy in some ways is carrying on Uta's will, the will of this new Genesis. And this also might require another focused video on the connection and the parallels between Uta's failed dream and Luffy's probably successful dream come the end of the series. Assuming that let's say Blackbeard 
does actually get the W and Luffy dies in the series. After this, Uta did travel with Shanks and company to various places, but never got beyond the red line. So they just stayed in the hemisphere of the East and South Blue and the Grand Line first half. And apparently also they sailed the Con Belt as well. So how exactly they were able to do that, not, not too sure. But if that is the case, where the Red Pirate crew could sail through the Con Belts for whatever reason, this could explain, let's say, how Shanks could arrive at Marine Forge so quickly after deal with Kaido. So hopefully in the future, that's expanded upon even more. The next thing here real quick is that after Shanks left Uta on Elegia, he became a heavy drinker. He did drown his sorrows in alcohol. And of course, that's more insight onto Shanks' character. After this, three years from the current timeline in the series, the Denden Mushis that we see in the film are SSG prototype Denden Mushis made by Dr. Vegapunk. We actually do see the SSGs on their shells. Apparently, their shells are man-made and they do not exist in the wild. They have beautiful functionality, mouth speakers, antenna for microphones, and here's the kicker. And they have the power to transmit telekinetic waves to people. What? These Den Den Mushis can transmit telekinetic waves and Vegapunk was able to somehow make something that could do that. That is crazy. So this tech in the world one piece is starting to look more and more and more limitless. And this had probably an added effect during Uta's time in that three years to build her community and her fan base, where she would actually get a stronger connection between herself and her fans, probably due in part to these telekinetic waves. And it also might explain too, the reason why Rob Lucci could not mute the Den Den Mushi on their end, once Uta started to sing the top music of song, because that song also probably had an effect on those telekinetic waves and it couldn't be shut down no matter where someone was in the globe. So that all right there, I think is very fascinating. The fact that in the Chronicles Uta, they say, and I quote directly, people from all over the world are saved from daily suffering and become absorbed with the world of dreams. And quote, that I think is an important detail in understanding why these people, her fan base, viewed her as some sort of savior and why she herself, even though at some point she knew that she created that genocide on Elegy Island, the weight of that responsibility on a global scale pushed her forward. And in the process, in order to try and achieve her dream, no matter what, she started to consume wake shrooms. So here we go. So the wake shrooms, also called the Nezukino Ko, we know from the movie, they force them to stay awake for a long period of time, and then eventually they'll die from the wake shrooms. And also we know that their emotions are like destable, like all over the place, but also they will cause someone to quote, lose their humanity, end quote. And apparently Uta had no idea that was an effect of the wake shrooms. So what that means exactly in full detail, it's kind of unclear as to like quote, lose your humanity, end quote. It could be the emotional turbulence, maybe, but it could be deeper than that too. But this change is more likely on the darker path, the Sith Lord side of things. And again, Uta was not aware of these effects at all. After that, in the Chronicles of Uta, it's explained more clearly, she was not, let's say, trying to terminate her own life, quote unquote, but more so she was trying to escape the harshness of real life and she was going to transfer herself and everyone else into a quote, better world. So the idea of death in movie is a very loose idea because it's a physical death, but not a spiritual or soul based death. But trust me, I'll get to really, really soon. But the idea is that death in the colloquial sense is not the same that applies here in the movie. And you can arguably expand that to the series as a whole. But again, I'll get to that soon enough. And then finally, for the Chronicles of Uta, part of the reason why she had such a grand concert was to get Shanks' attention and have Shanks come to that concert. So she did in some way plan for Shanks to come and see her. But it was kind of hard to tell in the movie because again, her psyche was being altered more and more and more by the wake shrooms. 
So that is it when it comes to the Chronicles of Uda section for this video. Mugen no Rogoku ka One Piece film Red. And now we get into the deep dive. That's right, boys and girls, the deep, whoo the deep, 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 deep dive into the film Red Insanity. And this deep dive is broken down into five major parts. So first of all, part one, Figarland bloodline. So some of the Gorosei want to take Uta in now that it's revealed that she is the daughter of Shanks. However, one of them states, I think it's the Gandhi one, he states, even if she is of Figureland blood. And then when he says that, the other Gorosei kind of hesitate. So this means that Shanks is likely of this Figureland blood slash family, and it is likely that it's ties to the God Valley incident since it was around that point in time that Roger found Shanks in that treasure chest, just how Shanks on Uta in a treasure chest. And of course, part of the reason why the Gorosei are willing to meet Shanks in secret too. And there is somewhat of a distinction here between the subtitle version and the dub version of the movie, where the way the dub version goes about in the movie, they make it seem like taking Uta in will not be easy because she may be of Figureland bloodline. This would insinuate that a member of the Figureland family has some sort of natural powers, some sort of natural gifts, like the mink or the giant, stuff like that. And recall the two abilities I mentioned before in the video in the One Piece Volume 4 Billion section. Shanks is A, called the Murderer of Observation Hockey, and B, Shanks has the ability to create a flaming sword. The reason why Shanks can do these things potentially is also tied to his lineage. And if that's the case, then the world government might have actually view them particularly dangerous if it turns out that the Figureland family were against them, which might have led to the disappearance of God Valley, which a lot of folks do theorize probably met the same fate as the Lulucia kingdom. And if that's the case, then that means that the Figureland blood slash family is also relative in some way, both good and bad, potentially, to Im Ooh. Because what destroyed the Lucia Kingdom is most likely, most likely, not confirmed, but most likely being controlled in some way by Emu. So Emu made the call to destroy God Valley, which could pertain to the figure of land blood that is turning against them, potentially Shanks's family. And one of the key things here that Oda discusses about Uta's design is that her design is based off of the future and angels. Like Squidward future, future. and angels. Mm. Now, at a bare minimum, this could coincide with the angel races, the Barricans, the Shandians, the Skypeans, because we know that there are ancient ruins on the moon, and it depicts the angel races being quite advanced at that point in time. And ideally, the technology that Vega Punk is trying to recreate is the technology of that time in a general sense. So that right there is deep dive numero uno. Numero uno. We're not, woof, woo, not done yet. Number two deep dive, the Sing Sing world. Wow. Okay, so I'll sign up here. When Uta sings to people, their souls are transported into an alternate version of their world where Uta herself is like nigh omnipotent. She can do whatever, however, whenever she wants to do it. And what's also really wild, what's really nuts here is that there are other people in the movie that have alternate dimension abilities too, Bluno and Brule. Bluno with the door door ability and Brule with her own mirror world. Even their alternate dimensions are stuck within the alternate reality of the Sing Sing world. So since the mirror world and the door door alternate dimensions are within the alternate reality of the Sing Sing world, this means that the Sing Sing world is on a higher plane of existence or a higher dimension that literally no one can escape from 
unless Uda herself falls asleep and or they're set free naturally. This is excluding Ta Musica. So that idea is a radical, radical idea of not just all dimensions, but higher planes of existence existing in the world of One Piece. Again, hearkening back here to Oda's comments about her design being based off of the future and angels. Also recall what Robin said in chapter 203 when she is reading the point of the crocodile in Alabasta and she talks about the quote, age of heaven, end quote. And of course a cherry on top of this banana split would be the fact that the Nika ability exists and it's modeled after or potentially is after a sun god, the sun god Nika. And in that same movie, Brooke also mentions how Uta must have been blessed by the god or the gods of music. So keep in mind that in the real world, there are ideas of alternate dimensions existing. Like let's say for example, black holes being the gateways to alternate dimensions or having enough power to bend space and time itself to reach another dimension that is layered on top or below our own dimension. But there are much simpler ideas. Like for example, when we fall asleep, we can actually access other versions of ourselves through other dimensions. And isn't that ironic considering how that is the very same thing that we see happen with the folks that get absorbed into the Sing Sing world. Their real physical bodies fall asleep. And what tends to happen when you fall asleep at least the idea is that you have an astral projection of yourself, or in this case here, your soul. And your soul could cross between what? Dimensions. And the tech in One Piece is so radical, it's so busted, that we're getting to the point of manipulating space and time through warping. Dr. Vegapunk is doing that as we speak. And this warping is mimicking in some respects the warping ability of Von Aga and Trafalgar D water law. If the tech can mimic those fruits in some way, is it possible that tech in the world of One Piece can also mimic the alternate dimension based fruits? Particularly if the fruits themselves were created because of technological means. That just means that at one point in time, the tech got so good to where they could create pocket slash alternate dimensions. Mm. or at least travel to them and access them via bridges. And then it's also explained in the movie that the Sing Sing world stays active even after the Sing Sing Nomi user's death, forever trapping souls within it. So just like how the immortality surgery of the OPW Nomi, even though the fruit user dies, the effects are permanent. It's the same concept here. So if this was a thing that happened in the past, and the Sing Sing world existed back then in earnest. That means that alternate dimensions can exist back then slash were created by at least Duffer users of the past. And if they died and folks were still in there, then they were in there indefinitely. Meaning that in the world one piece, they are still there to this day. To this day. And from the idea of alternate dimensions, we springboard into the third point for the deep dive, the Norse demons. <sighs> okay, saddle up. The bridge between the Sing Sing world and the real world was a demon king. Hmm? Huh? A demon king known as Top Musica. And what we learn from the movie is that Top Musica was not created by the Sing Sing Duffer user, but it was summoned by that ability. When Robin reads the ancient language mural on the ceiling of the ruins about Top Musica, she says that it was created by the quote, fears and doubts of men, and it was given form. If a user of the Sing Sing No Me sings the namesake song of Top Musica, they will summon this demon back to this plane of existence. Dimension. And in the past, when Uta was on Elegia Island as a little girl, when the Reddit Pirates and Uta were going to leave the following day, there was a grand event held for them. And during this event, the citizens of Elegia, they broadcasted 
Uta's song throughout the entire country. But that was a grave mistake. The score that was hidden in the ruins underneath LG Island activated of its own will as if it was imparting its own twisted version of inherited will that is common in One Piece and went to Uta of its own will. Uta, who has the quote, voice of an angel, end quote. The idea of alternate dimensions also ties to the idea of souls in the world of One Piece. And there is no character right now more important when it comes to souls than Soul King Brook. So we all know that Brook, he has a soul wavelength that beats on a higher frequency which is why Brook is A, alive as a bone skeleton, and then B, can also affect other weaker soul-based entities, like the Chespi soldiers of the Big Mom army. But also, Brook can tap into the, quote, winds of the netherworld for attacks, end quote. So the idea of the netherworld being real in One Piece may not be all that far-fetched, since demons can be summoned from another plane of existence slash alternate dimension. And when you take the concepts of a twisted and evil inherited will, and then the ideas of alternate dimensions existing and how these wills can even transcend those dimensions, combine that with the idea that I mentioned before, we're in the real world. Scientists theorize that black holes could be gateways to alternate dimensions? Isn't there someone who kind of fits a lot of these notes? <laughs> mm. This might also tie to who? Roronora Zoro and his connection with Ashra, the demon god. And I did a video a while back earlier this year talking about figuring out the quote source of Zoro's true power a while back. And I think now that video is actually going somewhere on the right track here because Zoro's soul, I think has a specific frequency or a stronger frequency than most other people in the world of One Piece that allows him to tap into these things, which is part of the reason why I believe that Oda was very purposeful when he made Zoro's affinity for hockey, armament hockey, which is the hockey that is in lockstep or is rooted in one spirit slash soul. What's also very super interesting too, is that when Uta begins to summon Tom Musica and she sings its namesake song, the subtitles in the movie change to Norse runes. Major left field, no Norse runes? Like on some God War action, really? Uta, how, why, why the Norse runes? And during my fourth viewing, my fourth viewing of the film, I did actually catch this too. In the ruins underneath Elegy Island, when Robin is reading the murals and she's Rima taught Musica, on the side of the murals, there are these horns that look like gallo horns or yalla horns, whatever you call it. The same ones that Hemdall blows to usher in Ragnarok. Mm, mm. Top Musica was on pace to do what with Uta? Literally usher in the end of the world. And what I said before about the creation of Top Musica, when Robert says the fears and doubts of men given form, what if it wasn't, let's say, the fears and doubts of men, but what if it's giants? There's one location we know for damn sure has a lot of ties to Norse mythology, Elbath. Always, always sliding on in Elbath. Always, always. Remember how the folks of Elbath have like rituals of sorts. In chapter 866, it's explained that they do a winter solstice and how they fast for 12 days to pay respects to the sun. And in chapter 116 in Little Garden, Dory explains how the disputes of their village where no side would yield at all would be decided by the quote, God of Elbaf, end quote, and how that God protected the one who was right. And finally, what does Hydrudin say to Mach Weiss 
when he beat him. He says, fly away to the kingdom of the gods with that disgusting Gunganir. So, <laughs> you can see here how Elbath and the Norse, all that stuff, the gods and the sun and so on and so forth. So the opposite side of the aisle can exist too, where they also had people, let's say on the dark side of Elbath, they were demon worshipers and trying to find solace with demons to escape from their hardship. And Brooke could be low key a sign of this because when he has access to the cold winds of the netherworld, what is that relative to in Norse mythology? Helheim. What is that place? Never go there, understand? Likely not the Helheim, but the dimension that the giants would call Helheim, which would also be quote the underworld, which would be an alternate reality slash dimension that would overlap exist within the confines of the world itself. I, I told you this was going to be a deep dive. I I no, no joke when I say deep dive, deep, deep dive. And we're not done yet because now we have number four of the five and number four is so. So a lot of what's before in the previous section does tackle the soul aspects of the series for damn sure. And of course, now you're beginning to believe on some Morpheus action that soul in this movie is a very important thing here. Hidden elements of the movie that pertain to souls and demons like pop musica. The song script found the right person and moved of its own will. And doesn't that just so happen to sound familiar? Like we heard this before in Wano Country with a certain individual with a unique devil fruit? Not law, no. I'm pretty sure it was Monkey Jesus Luffy, where in chapter 1044, the Gorosei specifically explain that the Gomu Gomu no Mi or the Hito Hito no Mi Maro Nika for centuries upon centuries was always trying to avoid a certain set of people. Ah, oh, like the fruit itself grew a pair of wings or set of legs and started to move on its own. And what's also a very important sign of soul being important in one piece is also the connections between Luffy and Shanks, particularly Katakuri and Brulee and Usopp and Yasop, where those guys can actually see through each other's eyes the same way Momonosuke could see through the eyes of Zunisha. And they're able to see through each other's eyes, despite the fact that one party is literally stuck in another dimension. Their physical bodies are still asleep. And yet Yasop and Katakuri can see through the eyes, technically speaking, of the astral projections, their souls that are trapped within the Sing Sing world. So this idea of, let's say, a soul link is similar to the idea that uh, Parvijan brings up in a few of his videos, uh, Mind Rope. I have had some collabs with Parvision on my Cole Requiem channel and on his main channel as well. So I guess all links in the box below. But the idea that he brings up is essentially a mind rope where people across the world are all connected to another via a mental rope. Now I would argue more so this probably just ties to folks that have particularly strong connections, at least on a regular basis. Because the idea does, let's say, explain why sugar can turn someone into a toy and the entire world would forget about that person's existence. One of the ways to make it make sense is that everyone is connected in the world in some way. And this is how you would slide in the voice of all things. Momonosuke and Zunisha can link up. In the sense of Katakuri and Brule in the movie, they can do the same thing. But let's say for argument's sake here, that people that are very skilled with observation hockey can mimic to an extent the voice of all things. Potentially anyone with the voice of all things could do that with any other living thing. So you could walk into another creature and see the very same things that that creature can see. In theory, keep in mind that in chapter 894, Rayleigh during that flashback in the middle of the Katakuri fight explains how Luffy, his observation color is more attuned 
to the emotions of living things. I wonder that also applies to folks like Oden, folks like Roger, and folks like Momonosuke, the folks that have the voice of all things. Do they also have a stronger connection to, let's say, this global soul link or mind rope, and that's why the voice of all things can be utilized for potentially all things, not just for all living things, but potentially inanimate objects as well, like the poneglyphs. Because Rayleigh also explains during the Shaboni Archipelago arc that Roger couldn't read the poneglyphs, he could hear him. Unless the poneglyphs also have a soul embedded into them as well. Deep, deep. Deep, 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 deep. And do you remember one of the things that Whitebeard told Blackbeard before he died? <laughs> I did a video seven years ago talking about how this could be more literal rather than a figure of speech. Will the chickens come home to roost? So once again, this movie does an outstanding job to fortify, to really emphasize the idea of mind ropes or soul links. And during the movie, when is the soul link at its peak, at its zenith? With the very last attack that Shanks and Luffy do on Top Musica. Here is the final section of this part of the deep dive. Gods, that is the final section. When Luffy goes from Snake Man Gear 4 to Gear 5, and at the same time, he links up with Shanks for his final attack against Top Musica. Shanks creates the energy of a bird of some kind and Luffy a lion of some kind. And the two attacks go plunging forward together at Top Musica. And at some point, they actually merge. The attacks of Luffy and Shanks merge to form a golden griffin with a lion's head. And that's how they defeat Top Musica. So, there are key details here. Number one, Shanks' sword is called Griffin. And the thing that he fires from his sword for a final attack is probably that or at least an eagle. And an eagle in most myth and colloquially is known as the king of the birds. And the Griffin in myth is the ruler of all creatures. The mythical creature that stands on top of all. Second is Luffy. He makes a lion, and the lion has a sort of flaming mane of sorts around it. And colloquially, lions are the king of beasts. So you have the king of the birds, an eagle, combining with the king of the beast, a lion, and then they form the ruler of all creatures, which attacks Pop Musica. The lion also represents the Sunny Go in some respects. Since the Sunny Go in the movie was also existing and running around like a living creature, which in terms of soul will indicate that it has a cool Balter man like the Merry Go did. But I digress. Not only, of course, is the lion a representation of the Sunny Go, but also thereby a sun. Sun who? God. Who? Nika. So, when Luffy and Shanks attack, and their attack fuses, despite the dimensions being cut off from one another, now it could be just imagery, but if it's not imagery, and the attacks genuinely combined and cross simultaneously through alternate dimensions, the soul bridge, the soul link, once again coming in play here, between two individuals that have a very strong connection here, Luffy and Shanks. And the attack itself creates a new entity, assuming that Shanks already fired a griffin from his sword, that again looks like a golden griffin with a lion head. It is the king of kings, or the king of the gods. In myth, the griffins are known to be the guardians of treasure. It would do things in myth like guard golden mines. And the griffins will also lay their eggs there with golden nuggets around. The golden attack is, you can argue, the representation of at least the birth of a god, since at the very least, 
it's the first time we're seeing Luffy go Sun God Nika for the first time in official animation. But of course, it can go even deeper than that since Shanks, like a griffin's egg, was found in a treasure chest full of gold and was found around the time of when? God Valley. At the end section of Wano Country, in chapter 1054, what did Shanks tell Ben Beckman? It's time. To go after what? The treasure. Which treasure? The One Piece. Woo! Okay. I said back then, I had the feeling that the person who be waiting for Luffy on Laugh Tale at this point in time, I don't think it's gonna be Blackbeard. What if it's Shanks? The griffin that guards the treasure that's there on Laugh Tale, ready to test Luffy and his crew to see if they are worthy of getting the One Piece treasure. So I may have to do, cause this video is super long. I may have to do an exclusive video on that and break down what I said before in the past and this video and explain why it's probably the case here, where it's gonna be Shanks and his crew on Laugh Tale. But there is a lot to digest and think about for this video, so hopefully this deep dive was like for you, five gum. It stimulated your senses. Stimulate your senses.